I know what some of you are thinking. I've been here since 7.30 this morning. I've listened to 18 thought-provoking, challenging, mentally exhausting talks, and then they bring out the opera guy, right? <laughs> that's, that's not very fair. Uh, and it is kind of daunting to bat clean up after a, a, a lineup such as this. A lot of great thought-provoking talks. What's even more daunting for me is I'm gonna talk a little bit about something that I don't know a whole heck of a lot about. I'm gonna talk about baseball. I've always made broad parallels between professional sports and opera, claiming that they make similar demands on the body. They demand a confluence of natural ability, highly specialized training, commitment, work, yada, 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 maybe above all, luck. I recently saw a documentary about a minor league baseball team called the Battered Bastards of Baseball. It's fabulous, and it, it, it blew my mind because it, it was a collection of guys that had maybe all of these qualities except for the luck part. For whatever reason, they were looked over by the major leagues. But it was great to watch a bunch of guys get together and play for the love of the game and see how the crowd responded to that. It compelled me to look a little further at these parallels between opera and professional sports, specifically professional baseball. But I realized if I was gonna do that, I needed to have a vocabulary lesson. See, I think I know as much about baseball as the average person knows about opera, or so I thought. So there's no need to read these oversimplified definitions. I think if prompted, anybody in this room could come up with a reasonable definition of what opera is, of what baseball is. But a little bit of history that you may not know. Baseball is said to have been invented in 1845 by Alexander Cartwright. Opera had its debut just a short 250 years prior uh, in Florence with Daphne's, uh, I'm sorry, with Jacopo Perry's Daphne. Both of these things are spectator sports that are rooted in history and tradition. So why did one of them speak to me and the other one not so much? Baseball never really landed to me. Perhaps because of vocabulary. See, I grew up in a football household. And by the time I was in third grade, I could spot a block in the back on TV before the ref threw the flag. When I was in seventh grade, I could name the complete roster of the New York Giants Super Bowl champ team. But baseball, I didn't speak the language. The more I thought about it, though, even with very little exposure to baseball, I knew the rules. I can somehow name two dozen professional baseball players. I somehow know that the Baltimore Orioles are in first place in the AL East. Pretty impressive for someone who has no vocabulary for baseball. My point is, the American pastime is part of the public consciousness, part of the public vocabulary. I want to play a little game with you to prove my point, hopefully. Raise your hand if you know who this guy is. Almost everybody. Derek Jeter, five-time World Series champion shortstop. I've never seen him play live or on TV, but I know who he is, and I know a lot about him. Um, raise your hand if you know this guy. One, and it's my wife, great. Uh, <laughs> this is Jonas Kaufmann, the 45-year-old German tenor phenom, star, uh, star of the Metropolitan Opera and beyond, arguably the most in-demand opera singer of our time. Leaving baseball, but raise your hand if you know her. A lot of people know Danica Patrick, 2009, she took third place in the Indy 500, the highest place ever by a woman. We all know her story. We all love her story. But how many have seen her race? Two. Yet we still know who she is. Continuing on, do we know who this is? Two. Great. It's one more than I thought. This is Anna Netrebko, uh, who recently sang at the opening ceremonies for the Sochi Olympics in front of millions, if not billions, of people. In addition, she sang at opening night of the Met last year, which was broadcast to thousands in Times Square. Keeps a busy schedule performing all over the world. Who knows who this is? I don't either. Honestly, this is what comes up when you do a Google image search of Little League. Uh, but hopefully, <laughs> it's going to prove a point. Who knows who this is? A lot more hands went up. We know that this is Jackie Evanchko. Uh, the runner-up in the fifth season of America's Got Talent. Now, I don't mean to take anything away from this sweet little girl who does have talent, but let's be honest. If you walked out onto Market Street right now and stopped the first 10 people that you met, you say, name me an opera singer, a good number of them would mention Jackie Evanchko 
or they'd mention the blind guy or the cell phone salesman. Ask those same 10 people to name 10 baseball players, and they're not going to name my cute little league kid. Yet his skill level in comparison to Derek Jeter is quite comparable to this sweet little girl in comparison to Anna Netrebko. Yet we call them opera singers. We don't call anybody that can hit a ball with a bat a baseball player. See, the arts have fallen out of our collective vocabulary, opera specifically, over the past 50 years. It was not too long ago that on the Ed Sullivan Show, you could hear Beverly Sills sing opera. You could hear Luciano Pavarotti. It's not too long ago that Maria Callas was as attractive to the paparazzi as Miley's twerking is. But I digress. The point is, we're not getting this in school. We're not getting it in the media. So without that vocabulary, how did a kid, yes, it's me, it says copyright mom, 1991. Um, how did a kid who was supposed to be a famous rock and roll guitar player, well, although he grew up in a musical household, had no vocabulary for opera, how did he fall in love with it? I went to my first opera as an adult, and I'll be honest, it was to impress a girl. I don't remember her name. I do remember, however, being completely gobsmacked by this work that was written in Germany in 1845, the same year that Cartwright was here uh, inventing baseball. This work just transformed me to my core, seeing the amount of work that was involved in bringing this thing together just blew my mind. And I decided I wanted to learn the rules of that game, maybe even play. So I started slowly, first by watching, then by doing. And I remember the quizzical look that I used to get from all of my high school friends and my family. They'd say, opera, how'd you get into that? And I honestly didn't have a good answer for them at the time. But looking back on it now, I realized that some of the things that spoke to me are some of the same things that speak to people about professional sports. Let me explain. Ted Williams once said that hitting a baseball consistently is one of the most difficult things to do in all of sports. And I can't say I disagree. If you think about it, you've got to hit a ball that's round with a bat that's round. You've got to hit it squarely. It's coming at you 90 miles per hour. And oh yeah, there are 30,000 people watching. So it's hard not to appreciate the poetry in motion that comes from watching somebody do the seemingly impossible with grace, ease, and even beauty. And in opera, we walk a similar tightrope. You're using a finely tuned set of muscles to hurl your voice to the back of an auditorium without amplification over a full orchestra, somehow staying in sync with your colleagues on stage. You're doing it in a foreign language. And like baseball, you're wearing tight pants. So <laughs> there are a lot of similarities between the two. The biggest similarity is us. It's you and me, the audience. You know, the energy that comes from a crowd can help a team overcome adversity. The energy that comes from a crowd in the theater is kind of like nothing else. Sure, there are some differences between the two. Although I don't think you'll get turned away from the opera or the symphony today if you come in in jeans, they may draw the line at the foam finger. Um, our running time is about the same. We both clock in at about three hours. Although I've never been to an opera where there's a seventh inning stretch. Note to self, we should totally add a seventh inning stretch. I think that would be great. The, the, one of the big differences is that in opera, we don't keep score. Someone doesn't pull out a stat sheet and start keeping track of what percentage of high notes the soprano hits. The objectives are different. But again, there are a lot of, a lot of great similarities. The biggest difference, the biggest chasm between the two is actually when it comes to funding. See, without foam fingers to sell, without jerseys with the tenor's name on the back for us to sell, without a section of the daily newspaper every day devoted to artistic endeavors, without a corner of the local news broadcast helping us brand and merchandise, you know, we have a cost issue in opera. Now, in Europe, uh, the government makes up that gap. It's very heavily subsidized. Here in the US, we rely on the wonderful, wonderful support of passionate individuals. We're very lucky to live in a state like Delaware that has acknowledged the collapse of corporate funding for the arts, and they've really stepped up to the plate. See, another baseball analogy. Uh, they've allowed us to, it's a sickness now. I'm not going to be able to stop. They've allowed us to survive, you know, but, but kind of barely. And some 
other cities haven't been so lucky. This is a partial list of opera companies that have closed just since 2008. I want you to think for a minute about what this means to those communities that suddenly have made a little less space in their community for beauty. You think of the talented artists that have had to move to other parts of the country for work. You think of the economic impact of theater goers that no longer visit the restaurants on their way to the theater. Where I get most alarmed is where I bring this back to sports. I look at a lot of these smaller communities and I look at them, as I look at Wilmington, as sort of the farm team, you know, the minor league team for opera. And I don't mean that in a, in a diminutive sense by any means. They can do compelling art, but these are wonderful places for young talent to develop. The Blue Rocks have had over 100 players go on to the major leagues. At Opera Delaware, we've had about 100 go on to what I call the major leagues of San Francisco, Chicago, and beyond. We've had a handful of, uh, of major league all-stars come from the Blue Rocks. And we've had the operatic equivalent come from Opera Delaware. The Metropolitan Opera stage, I think, qualifies as, as the all-star team. So, I started asking myself, what happens with all of these regional opera companies that are collapsing? What if it happened in baseball? You know, it would affect the communities that support the teams, and it would affect the overall game and the pros. People wouldn't have had that chance to develop their skill. So I want to talk a little bit about a solution. Cooperstown, New York, has a, popu a full-time population of under 2,000 people. Yet, incidentally, it's home to the Baseball Hall of Fame and one of the more well-known opera festivals in the country, the Glimmerglass Festival. Baseball Hall of Fame brings 300,000 annual attendees who come up there to look at relics and grab a, a glimpse of the past. Glimmerglass brings in 30,000 people in just six weeks who travel from all over the world to see opera in a theater with no air conditioning, with no running water, all for the love of the game. So what's my point? We've established that probably we're not in, uh, we don't need to be concerned about the minor leagues collapsing because they're pretty attached at the hip with their major league counterparts. But what about these regional opera farm teams? Stay tuned for one last bad baseball analogy. If you build it, they will come. Now, like Cooperstown, there are other successful opera festivals in the country. Sarasota, Florida, Fort Worth, Texas, Hanover, New Hampshire. All of these markets have leveraged the cultural and tourism assets that they have, and they've condensed their offerings into a short period of time to make it attractive to already existing opera fans to come and spend a weekend. And if you stop and think about it, if we can be bold as regional opera companies. If we can have an artistic footprint that is compelling, there's no reason that they won't travel here. You see, this is a very underserved audience. People that love opera have fewer opportunities, opportunities, sorry, opportunities to see it. And, and if we build it, they will come. Just as baseball fans want to go to spring training to get a glimpse of the next star, just as they want to go to the minor leagues, Opera fans will travel here to experience the game in its truest form. And although we're not going to give up on retaking our place in the public vocabulary, although we're going to continue to work to bring people into this wonderful art form two people at a time, why not start with full houses of people that already love it and together can enjoy this beautiful 400-year-old musical language one glorious game at a time? Thank you.